Welcome to ACRA's webinar on the smart, or, you know, current current practices, and we'll hear today from the guys from BCRC and our sponsors for the day, PCTE. I'll just run through the, the speakers. We've got Jonathan Dyson and Karash Kashfarian from BCRC. Jonathan's a New South Wales State Manager for uh, BCRC, and Karash is a Senior Engineer, also based in Sydney. Um, <clears throat> The presentation today is about modern trends in assessment and remediation of concrete structures. Uh, the boys will run through non-destructive test techniques for concrete um, because these are continuing to develop at pace as I guess technology gets better and software gets better as well. The webinar will focus on some of the latest concrete inspection, testing and repair technologies available in Australia, uh, talk about their advantages and their limitations. In the area of asset inspection and documentation, until recently, the lack of efficient software applications was you know, mucking productivity up. BCRC have got the new smart inspect process, which combines cutting edge inspection software with state-of-the-art NDT technology, uh, along with the advanced interpretation capabilities that come out of it. And the you know, lads will both go through that process shortly. Uh, building on the high quality condition data obtained through smart inspect sorry smart inspect our presentation and bcrc's presentation will then discuss some modern and innovative concrete repair technologies with a focus on available cathodic protection systems as well as provide a brief refresher on good practice for traditional concrete patch repairs um, and that's to ensure value finding for the client for the asset owners a little bit about jonathan um, as I said, he's New South Wales manager for BCRC. Got a major of a master of engineering science in structural at Uni of New South Wales, and a bachelor of engineering uh, from University of Sydney. <clears throat> he's a member of the Australasian Corrosion Association, chartered engineer, and New South Wales branch president and Z11 review committee uh, for the Concrete Institute of Australia, amongst other things. He's had 17 years uh, in the industry covering building transport water mining and marine infrastructure sectors um, it's got strong technical consulting and project management skills and in-depth knowledge of structural condition and durability assessments uh, on reinforced and structural steel design kurosh uh, as a senior engineer and a smart inspect product manager so he'll be telling us uh, sharing a lot of his um, experience there He's got a Master of Engineering Science and a Bachelor of Engineering um, in Structural and Civil. Um, he's a Chartered Professional Engineer with Engineers Australia. He's also an uh, Executive Committee member of TUSI Incorporated. Um, maybe Kurosh, you can tell us what that is a little bit later. His professional experience, he's got 20 years engineering experience covering both contracting and consulting in building, transfer, water, mining and infrastructure sectors, sectors, sorry. Uh, he's got a strong technical consulting and project management skills and in-depth knowledge of structure condition assessment, also in concrete uh, structural steel, but also tim timber and masonry as well. So that is, um, that's enough of the introductions. I could have added a bit more, but it'll do for now. So I'll hand over to uh, Kirosh and Jonathan, and they will be uh, working through the presentation together. So I'll shush now and come back later. Oh, sorry, I did. <laughs> I should mention. Um, put your questions in the in the Q and A um, part of the uh, of the presentation, and we'll catch them up at the end of the show. Any red hot urgent ones i guess put your hand up as well but i think we'll probably most efficiently deal with questions at the end thank you okay thanks a lot graham for the introduction so and and thank you all for attending today i hope that uh, your valuable time is um is worthwhile for you and we can give you a bit of an interesting insight into some updates in concrete repair assessment um specification and inspection and modeling so as mentioned, I'm, so I'm Jonathan, just so you know, I'm not Kurosh, I'm Jonathan. Um, 
the New South Wales manager. So look, just a, a very quickly, just a bit about BCRC. We're durability and materials consultants. Um, we're members of ACRA, corporate members of ACRA. Um, and we basically, we basically, we cover all the, the main construction materials, concrete, steel, timber, asphalt, et cetera, and, and many others as well. And we break our, we break our sort of our work that we do into three areas and all those three areas combined, basically we call the sort of the asset life cycle engineering process. Those three areas are smart inspect, creed, which is our probabilistic modeling and reliability engineering for durability service and epic repair, which is our sort of our, our, our concrete and, and other, other materials like steel repair consultancy service line. So what we're going to do today in our talk is we will take you through firstly smart inspect what it is which is basically the tools modern tools including software inspection applications non-destructive testing equipment etc but not just the tools but also the, the smart inspect process is is it's a technology backed with all those tools but it's importantly it's also about the know-how and the experience and knowledge of uh, of bcrc and how to interpret the data that you collect with those tools. And, and as part of that, there'll, there'll be a bit of a talk about latest advancements in non-destructive testing for concrete structures. So Kurosh, my colleague Kurosh is going to talk about Smart Inspect and NDT mainly. I might chime in here and there just to add a bit more where I think that um, that is necessary or valuable. And then I'll talk about Creed and Epic Repair a bit later on. So basically over to you now, Kurosh. Hello, everyone. So, uh, so a few slides of this presentation as dedicated to the or new service line recently launched called the Smart Inspect. And it's a full package of all the expertise we had in the past for the inspections of structures, but also new addition to the line in the service, which is the software, which is actually digitizing all the inspection process and reporting and bringing a lot of value for the clients of the quality of the inspections and the time and money saving in the, in the end line product. The software has been made available to Australia to, through PCTE, and the main developer is the Screening Eagle. In the next slide, we're gonna see a, its promo video, and then we're gonna talk in more details about it. So basically, as you notice through the video, so all the uh, application uh, has a front end for mapping that runs through under iOS and actually an inspector can grab an iPad and walk to a site and walk across and observe the defects and lock them. The difference it makes putting aside the, all the limitations that paper and pen had, like you know, inspector need to carry 40 drawings to a site, um, water gonna drip on it, coffee gonna pour on it, uh, so you have the, the, the digital uh, logging media, that's not going to happen, so the quality is improved. But the most important thing is the, the capability of GPS tagging or geomapping, which comes with the Apple, actually, supported by the app using it. So uh, it means, basically, the inspector can walk through a site and uh, through the GPS tagging, the exact location of the defect, where is it standing and where the inspector facing, can be locked through quite accurate and going to remain there and all the information log stays in the cloud for future references and it's much much reliable than paper um so that also there are other features and other benefits uh, through it so uh, instantly the software analyzes the information that the inspector has put through and uh, we will see later on how we uh, the inspector has the capability of rate the severity of the any defect is tagging you can see through uh, uh, through the left hand side of the screen, the dots on the the asset have three different colors and actually can be multiple colors. The red dots are defects that the inspector has identified as major uh, or quite severe. The yellow dots are uh, minor, probably might not be need a repair, but might need to be looked at to keep an eye for future. 
And blue dots might be uh, totally different things, for example, a note about further testing or just uh, something even out of this, this box. So in very quick glance, uh, a, any other party, a stakeholder that future on references to the inspection can look into the, the uh, mapping and understand what they, based on their, their interests and what is important for them, they can trace. Um, so it's better, more communicative kind of tool. And also the information can be shared through, with the client, not only through the, the PDF reports, not only through the Excel data tables, but also the data locked in the cloud. We can give an access to the client now that client can see exactly what we see and uh, go through the uh, data has been logged already. Um, if the 2D dimensional inspection is not enough, the 3D support is available. So if the client has an IFC drawing, we can upload it to the, to the app and we do the, all the log, all the uh, mappings to the 3D. And even if that's not available, just using the camera of the iPad, we can create a digital twin of the asset and we try to take it from there and do looking from, uh, from that part. Yeah, so look, just to add a couple of things there. Yeah, so but you can integrate a BIM model into this as long as it's in the right file format into into the inspect to use to to then to then spot your defects etc and kind of i thought i'd just highlight as well one of the key things so look we've we've bcrc has tried a number of different inspection applications over the years um and they're obviously developing as time goes on very rapidly um and getting better and better but yeah we we tried a, a number of them over the years None of them really kind of you know hit the spot completely for what we needed and what we what what we really were going to help really help us significantly in what we do in inspection. But this one um, is is by far and away the best that we've come across. Um, and one of the things one of the things that makes it that way is that it can it has an indoor positioning function as well. So you know not only can it locate you when it's got access to satellites, the GPS, etc., but it can actually pretty accurately locate you automatically uh, when you're indoor as well. Anyway, back to you, Kuro. Should I go to the next slide? Yes, please. So the inspection templates are quite customizable, so even though there are some built-ins that you can use, uh, take off the shelf, but also the inspector can design whole the inspection process himself. So what you see on the left-hand side of the screen is a template that we put together specifically for a specific asset. So what the inspector needs to be doing is we do usually we do a desktop review of the asset. We see, try to predict what kind of uh, defects we are supposed to face. And we just shortlist, you know, you know the defects can be hundred different types. So, but when you customize it and you shortlist them, actually through the small screen of the iPad, what work you efficiently that you just don't need to juggle around too many defects and pick and uh, click on the type of defect you're logging. Also, you can see the severity box in the middle of the screen that the, the, all the color coded uh, based on the rate of the uh, defect. And also we can log anything we can actually log. So it, here we decided or the client was asking us to uh, record every defect size in three dimensions and also its quantity and much more. So anything yeah, is quite flexible. You can design and add all of the templates you're carrying with your site. And uh, all of that can be also reported. So all the information then uh, in the formats we're gonna show you in the next slide. So this is a typical report. On the left-hand side is the front page, uh, like a, a formal report for like a title box, geomap, allocation of the site and everything. On the right-hand side, this, all reports start with a full layout of the bay or the asset has been uh, mapped. So this has been a quiet, defective heritage slab that we did uh, on the start of this thing. Uh, like this bay might have been like 200 plus defects. So what comes in the reporting of the app handy with just really with a few clicks of a button, we get a detailed report as we can see through next uh, slide. Yeah, just before I move to the next slide, Kuros, just quickly, I'll just just make a couple of points here. So these these numbers, 41, 35, 36, et cetera, they're the, they're the unique identification number for each defect that's logged. But you can also see here there's a number of purple purple spots, which has got plus 5, plus 28, et cetera. So what that is is there's actually 28 defects in that area. So they, they're not 
If you zoomed in further on the application, you would then see the individual spot numbers for the individual text. But when you zoomed out like this, it's just showing you 28 in that area. So that's just wanted to clear that up. Next slide. Exactly. So for congestion, there are two solutions provided by the app. Uh, so just avoid congestions and give the information as accurate as possible to the client. So like in that spot that they have a 28. So automatically the app creates the reports. As you can see, spot by spot, and then it's going to get detailed that where location of each defect uh, map is in, in a full layout uh, location view of the asset and also in zoomed in view on the right hand side, next to all the information that the inspector has logged in terms of type of defect, its severity, and its dimensions. So that report is going to be issued to the client, but also client can access, not only we're going to issue this as a PDF report to client, but also we get access to the cloud-based apps we have, and client can see exactly what we see on the back-end editing software. And you can zoom in through the assets, especially if it's 3D, they can access pretty much everything. Yeah, next slide, please. And this is also the, the raw data, we call it. So everything that has been logged, again, can be exported to Excel. And again, the, the backend analysis further deeper, if the client is interested in the volume of the repairs, the surface of the repairs, or even anything that needs to be coded further, can be taken from this point. It can be just to, quite quick. Just to note, this, you know, you can basically ex extract this data. If you've entered it when you're doing the inspection into the software, you can extract this data pretty much instantaneously. And so in terms of efficiency for getting a bill of quantities, for example, it's it's just really changed the game quite significantly. Back to you, mate. Another advantage of the app, it uh, not, not only helps you to log the uh, all the inspections into the cloud, but also talks to the other sensors and devices available for the condition assessment, like cover meter, GPR, Pandit Array, Schmidt Hamam, uh, Impact Echo, and the resistivity tester being Rizipod, or at the moment app is developed to accept all this information and all the logs uh, can be sitting exactly the location that the test has been run alongside the visual inspection. So actually the, the information that the client uh, receiving is much richer and deeper uh, all next to each other for uh, interpretation and for analysis. So um, after the software side of thing, we're gonna look at today a bit the new trends and the hardware part of the appointment. You know, this is part of the fast evolving part of the NDT as well. And so uh, we, today we're gonna address the ultrasonic pulse echo, UPE, infrared tomography, and ground penetration rather, just called or known as GPR. So ultrasound, ultrasonic pulse velocity or UPV is quite popular and has been around for a couple of decades, quite reliable, but there are some limitations to it. So as you can see, we need a transmitter and a receiver to send and propagate the uh, compression ultrasound wave through the asset. And the faster it can travel, we know the quality of the asset is better. But because we need to do reach the backside of the, the component, is easy to do for columns and walls, but literally is impossible to do for slabs. And you know, slabs usually are a more defective component than the others. So we really need a solution in this area. And one solution on the table these days is the shear wave tomography, which in an abbreviation is called UPU or ultrasonic pulse echo. It actually, the sender and transmitter are designed to sit on the only one face of the asset and shear wave propagates and reflects back and Thanks to being a multi-channel uh, device, it uh, also helps to give you much more information than UPV used to give us. With UPV, we used to see, only we used to know that whether the, the, uh, that spot is defective or not, but with the shear wave tomography now, we know where the defect is lying, it's where, in what depths it is embedded, and uh, how large it is, and also on top of the overall uh, condition of the asset. Uh, in terms of reliability, shear wave tomography is a bit newer, but the, we are backed up by, for example, highly reliable standards like Eurocode, EN12504, 
recommending it and accepting all the results as valid and verifiable. Another technology we use these days and it's becoming more common is the infrared tomography. So the infrared, uh, the cameras are quite sensitive and any surface that we scan, they pick up the, uh, like the spectrum of the uh, thermal energy across that surface. This is quite handy in detection of voids behind the surfaces, draw me survey, finding water, if there's water behind surfaces, like shown uh, what you can see on the right hand side image and the lower the cold blue color indicates water has been found leaking through the uh, not properly sealed joints in this uh, facade element or render element. And on the left hand side, what we can see, we can see the sensitivity of this uh, device and its sensors. So we can see the reflection of light from the handrail on the left hand side wall as a diagonal uh, ray. The, the sensor has picked up its thermal difference and very well and truly, but also that the device has a limitation. And so interpretation of the finding of results is very important. So as you can see in the middle image, lower one, we correlate whenever we take the infrared uh, camera to a side, we try to correlate it with the drama survey and back up. And this is quite known practice in condition assessment. Whenever you do a testing, for example, you do a drama survey, you have to better use two different devices and two different methods verifying each other. And that actually gives you a high reliable findings. Uh, this case was going to court and really we couldn't miss that. Definitely we had to do it. But also it helped us to find a very, we found the infrared thermographic quiet, a correlatable uh, and verifiable with the uh, traditional drama survey, which can be done through hammer tapping and uh, drama rollers. Uh, there are limitations to it. It's very important when you get to the site. So early in the morning or the late in the afternoon is the recommended times because that's the times that actually have a good quiet that the sun started heating or cooling off. So you get a quiet contrast on the surfaces and you don't want surfaces to be saturated. For example, around lunchtime is not a good time. So what you can see on the left hand side image, the camera has picked most literally everything that we have marked in red circles except a little one on the right hand side, close to the facade of the asset. And this is not because camera is not sensitive enough. It is because uh, actually that area, we got to it a bit late and that surface is already saturated. So it's not good enough to be inspected with a camera. So timing is very important and is the biggest limitation of this technology in uh, drama assessment. Uh, another quite popular technology is ground penetration radars which they work with the um, electromagnetic waves and they are multi-channel and also they give you wide area of information into dimensions. They can pick the real locations, uh, depths of the asset. Also, it can give you a 3D uh, multi-layer reinforcement or multi-layer defects if, if it's there because of the multi-channel nature of them. They're quite handy, well-developed in different shapes and forms and sizes to uh, help you, the inspector, to scan different corners. Um, but as I said, what is very important with, with working with this device is calibration. So really with that calibration, and if you don't know how to do it, or if you don't do it literally, they, uh, it's quite erroneous in terms of depth of real or thickness of the asset, which is the main requirement of a client might be missed. So really the people used to be, need to be trained and need to, they need to know what to do. Um, one of the latest, uh, it, the more and more developments as we see, um, the, uh, it, we can see more, it goes toward automation. So like the GS8000, which is a low frequency device, it helps you even uh, do uh, subsurface investigations in Seoul and Deep Rock. And, but also it has been reinforced with a GPS antenna, which helps the inspector to um, assert large surfaces without needing to spend a lot of, spend a lot of time to set an uh, accurate grid and just you can walk across the surface as shown in the next slide. Like, uh, so you can see in the next slide, there's a stadium that has been mapped with this device. It's literally uh, the inspector walks through and the GPS works with the computer to eliminate the overlapping data and save a lot of time in that design. We have used a couple of different types of uh, this device, but to be honest, the, the most reliable found uh, we have hands out 
is Prosec at the moment? Yeah, I, I thought I might just add a couple of things to what Kurosh is saying there. So with GPR, well, with any, any non-destructive testing um, technique, really, what's, what's really important is that not only that you understand the capabilities of the technique and the equipment in terms of what it can do, but probably just as importantly, if not more importantly, that you understand what the limitations are and what the risks of inaccurate interpretation might be. Um, uh, for a GPR, to take an example, there's, there's a lot of GPRs on the market and they're, they're not all the same. They're very far from all the same. There's a very difference, very big difference in price point and in capability. And the Prosec GPR came, came along a few years ago and it sort of really did quite change the game quite significantly. As Kurosh mentioned, it's multi-phase. So what that means is that previous to the Prosec, there was, uh, you, if, if you had a concrete structure with lots of reinforcement congestion, you'd only pick up that top layer of reinforcement and you wouldn't really see anything underneath because it couldn't get past once it had identified steel at that level, it then that that basically shadowed anything underneath. But with the ProSec and its multi multi frequency uh, capabilities, you can get past that, and you can actually see multiple layers of reinforcement. Just as an example, there, um, there are some other GPRs on the market that are probably almost as good as the ProSec, but there are also many, many, many GPRs on the market that are not anywhere near as good. So, yeah, I just thought I'd add that in. All right, thanks, Kurosh, for your input. I think we might be over to me now. Yeah. So now we'll move on. So that's smart inspect and non-destructive testing. A bit of an update there. Um, so once you've done a, you know, once you've done a smart inspection um, and you've got really good data from from those tools, techniques, and 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 in, and knowing how to interpret it correctly, we then um, we then have what we call Creed, which is our probabilistic and reliability based um, modeling and, and analysis. For remaining service life or for service life if if it's a new structure you're talking about design service life so yeah look creed basically comes along once you have that data from smart inspect and it, it can then be used to determine what the remaining service life is very accurate much more accurately than previous measures and i'll go through that in future slides and then once you have that accurate modeling and understanding of the remaining service life that can then inform a value for money maintenance approach, which we which we do in our Epic Repair Service line. So, so what what Creed what Creed is really about is reliability engineering. What it, and and so look, structural engineering, sub durability engineering is is a bit like a, a sub branch of structural engineering. I like to think of it that way. Structural engineering has been doing reliability based engineering for a long time now, for well, it must be a few decades now. And um, so reliability engineering, really what it is, it's about understanding the consequences of, of, uh, of certain things happening and how much co the cost might be to make sure that doesn't happen. It's a basically a risk-based approach to design. Durability engineering has not been reliability-based until very recently, and that's what Creed is all about. So just to give you an example, I thought I'd throw this example in up front to set the scene and to give a bit of context. So in 2018, the Morandi Bridge, which was built in 1967 in Genoa, collapsed. And I'm sure we all remember this. It was big news at the time. And that was due to corrosion of the stay cables. Tragically, it led to 43 people dying. So they obviously looked at why this occurred, looked a lot at why this occurred, and they just they re, they found out that the replace they, they decided the replacement bridge should have robots for cleaning and inspection at regular intervals. So the problem with this, and one of the reasons that it, the collapse happened, was that the durability design of the bridge was not based on protecting against catastrophic failure. In other words, the reliability was inadequately considered. So then the question is, how do you provide high reliability? And that's really key. The Livio's brilliant blunders was, a, was, a, was about ignoring low probability outcomes. And that is an illusion, an illusion to do that. It's really important not to ignore low probability outcomes if they, if they have a high consequence. So as I say, it's a risk-based thing. You really have to consider all the possible outcomes and the consequences of those. And that's what reliability engineering, whether that's durability engineering or structural engineering is basically all about. There was also a lack of redundancy in this structure they found. 
And so that's another question, how do you achieve the required redundancy? And that's a question that structural engineers think about all the time, but durability engineers should be thinking about that too. So full probabilistic analysis of durability is, is a key part of CREED. And um, that's, 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 that's a new type of, of modeling essentially for durability. A lot of a long time, for a long time, durability modeling was done based on deterministic modeling. And this slide here is just trying to, I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on this slide. It's about understanding the variables that go into the modeling. So one variable might be the concrete cover to the reinforcement. Another variable, another variable might be the carbonation ingress. Everything is a variable in full probabilistic modeling. So nothing is a set value. Everything is a distribution, statistical distribution. And so to explain that a bit more, if you, if you take this example up the top, the graph up the top, if in this example, you have a mean cover, you have some cover, concrete cover data, and you have some carbonation depth data for your concrete structure that is of a certain age. And if you just use the mean cover and the mean carbonation depth in the modeling, that that'd be deterministic modeling, you would end up with a remaining service life of 93 years. So 93 years until the mean carbonation depth reaches the mean concrete cover depth. But if you, if you did full probabilistic analysis where you treated everything as a variable, so you can see here, you've got carbonation. It's not just actually always the same. Carbonation in one spot of the structure is, for example, 20 millimetres, but in another spot it might be 14 millimetres. In another spot it might be 23 millimetres. So it's a, it's a distribution. So if you understand that that's a distribution, and so is the concrete cover, then and you and you treat them that way, and you you use characteristic values. So the upper the upper carbonation depth, five percent carbonation depth, and the lower five percent concrete cover, and you do full probabilistic analysis for those five percent values. You actually get in that case a remaining service life of only thirty three years compared to ninety three years to doing deterministic modeling using mean values. Um, that's a big difference. So that's an example of deterministic modeling being unconservative, hopelessly optimistic, you might say. Just to have a look uh, at the next graph down below. So this in this example, you can so you can do term, deterministic modeling using characteristic values. So if you did that in this case, you use the characteristic cover and you used the characteristic carbonation, 95% carbonation. You, in a deterministic model, that was giving us 28 years remaining service life, which is actually less than what the full probabilistic analysis did. So that, in that, that's an example of deterministic modeling actually being overly conservative. So deterministic modeling can be sometimes overly conservative or sometimes hopelessly optimistic. Basically, it's just not as accurate as full probabilistic analysis. So you could, if you used a combination of characteristic so, for example, the characteristic carbonation and the mean cover, which you shouldn't really do, but sometimes people do that, then in this case, the deterministic modeling would give you 44 years. So, yeah, it's really important that you, you understand what you are using, whether you're using a mean value or for all the variables that go into modeling, whether you're using a mean value, whether you're using a characteristic value. And the long story short is that full probabilistic analysis is is more reliable, it gives higher reliability and it gives more accurate modeling to understand what your actual service life, remaining service life of a structure is. And that might be remaining service life to time of initiation of reinforcement corrosion, or it might be factoring in um, the propagation period for reinforcement corrosion as well. So it might be for, it might be modeling until the time that a concrete starts to spoil due to the corrosion of the reinforcement, for example. So CIA Z701, which is the first volume of the durability series of the recommended practices that the Concrete Institute of Australia has published, it has a table here which talks about reliability, different levels of reliability. So a reliability of 1.3 is a set, and this is based on international, this stuff is in international standards as well. Reliability of 1.3 equates to a probability of failure of 10%. Whereas a reliability of 3.6, so a higher reliability, equates to a probability of failure of 0.01%. So you might choose different reliabilities for different types of structures and where the consequences of something occurring may be higher, greater or lower. 
Um, there is no guide in Australian standards at the moment for durability target reliability. Model code FIB, sorry, FIB model code 2020, it does propose, it has some discussion on this and it proposes 1.5, a reliability of 1.5 for, for, for a normal durability situation of a, of a fairly average sort of structure and that including the propagation period for reinforcement corrosion. So ISO 2394 is the, is the standard for reliability based engineering design. And um, it advocates, you know, basically a risk-based approach, which is essentially what reliability and en design engineering is all about. Um, and so just a, another table here, which sort of highlights that, you know, if you're talking about the consequence of, some, of failure of some, of some outcome that might occur, it could be small, it could be moderate, it could be extreme. And also you, 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 it's inevitable that also costs the safe of the, the relative cost of safety measures also comes into play. So if you have, for example, something that is a small consequence if, if a failure occurs and it's a low cost, it's a low cost to implement safety measures. Well, then you might say, let's go for a reliability of 2.3 in that case, which is a reasonably high reliability because even though the consequence of failure is small, it doesn't cost much to actually implement those safety measures. But if the cost of those safety measures is high, then you say, oh, the consequence of that happening is pretty small. It's quite expensive to, to implement sort of extra safety measures. So we'll go for a reliability of zero in that case, and we'll, and we'll base our design on that. So just this is just another slide, just an example of one of the parameters that goes into creed modeling and how it's a variable. It's not, a, it's not a single value. Chloride content, the critical chloride content that, will, that is, initiates reinforcement corrosion in concrete. Now, you know, that, that, that's different, whether, it's, whether you're talking about mild steel, mild black steel, or if the steel is galvanized reinforcement, or if it's stainless steel reinforcement, those, those valuables, those variables, sorry, are different. And what that, that's different in terms of the mean value that initiates the corrosion. Obviously, galvanized and stainless have higher mean values of chloride content before corrosion will initiate. It's also different in terms of the, the variable, the variable distribution. So in this case, black steel, the distribution for black steel is much narrower than the distribution for stainless steel. So, you know, a lot of times in modeling, we we've all we've assumed, and it's and it's common practice in the industry to assume a value of 0.4% by weight of cement, 0.4% of chloride ions by weight of cement is the value that will initiate reinforcement corrosion. And that's been used over, over many, many years, but that's a single value. And the reality is that as I'm explaining here in this slide, it's not, that, that's just not reality. It, it's not always the, the, the case that 0.4% is the value at which chlorides, uh, sorry, at reinforcement will start to corrode. In some structures, the reinforcement might start to corrode at values down at 0.1% or maybe even a bit lower in terms of the chlorides by weight of cement. In other structures, in other environments, with other concrete mixes, et cetera, you might have a structure which, and I'm talking about mild steel reinforcement here, you might have a structure in which you can get up to say 2% of chlorides by weight of cement before reinforcement will start to corrode. And that's what this sort of distribution here is all about. And that's the so you use the distributions in full probabilistic analysis and to get more accurate outcomes. So once you've got once you've done your um your modeling, your full probabilistic creed modeling, and you've got reliable, accurate understanding of what your remaining service life is in the structure, then you can do then you can design effective value for money repairs because you've got you've started off with getting excellent good data from your smart inspect process. You've then understood and calculated what the remaining service life is accurately using full probabilistic analysis via our CREED system. So that's a really good starting point to then be able to design value for money repairs for your, for your client, for the asset owner. So what Epic Repair is all about, it's an independent approach for selecting the remediations that meet the client needs. There's lots of different types of repairs, as we as we all know, no doubt, on the call in terms of for concrete structures. And today I'm going to focus really on uh, patch repair and on electrochemical techniques, cathodic protection, because patch repair is obviously very common. Um, but there are lots of times we've seen lots and lots of occasions where patch repairs are done poorly and they 
they fail very prematurely. And I think it's actually a real problem in the industry that needs to be addressed and, and fixed up. So what are the keys to, to, to achieving performance with a patch repair? There's a number of key considerations, one being proper substrate preparation. So once you've broken out the concrete, ensuring that that substrate that the patch material is going to be put on top of is sound, has a good surface roughness, etc. One of the things to consider is what is the technique used for breaking out the concrete? Because different techniques, such as you know mechanical breakers, um, you know, hydro demolition, needle scaling, etc., they 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 have a different risk of introducing micro cracking into the surrounding concrete. And there's a really good guide, ICRI guide three ten point two, which has some great detail on on this, on, on the risks of different techniques when it comes to concrete breakout and the risks of introducing micro cracking. So once you've broken out the concrete, you then the next step is to make sure you achieve a, a good concrete surface profile. So surface roughness of the substrate, essentially. That's important to, to, to get adequate bond and adhesion of the patch repair material or of the overlay that you're applying. So not just for patch, cementitious patch repair materials, but it can also can also be important for things like protective coatings. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes you might, depending on what you're talking about, you might want a, a medium level concrete surface profile, or sometimes you might want um, a high surface profile. And uh, the other thing is that the, the better the surface profile, the rougher the surface profile, the more kind of Shear and shear interlock you're going to have between the patch repair material and and the parent concrete. So the more it can act as a monolithic sort of structure or element. Um, so also, you need to think there are many other things you need to consider for for a good patch repair, and such as the the, the, the compatibility of strength, dimensional shrinkage, etc., thermal movements between the patch repair material and the parent concrete. What we've seen a number of times on sites is very, very poor control of the batching of the patch repair material, particularly if, if you're using a bagged cementitious product. Um, so it, that's that's really important that those that the batches, the batching of the material is done consistently and it's done in a controlled way. We've seen so many examples of too much water being added or too little water being added, and it really does affect the outcome of your patch repair. Proper placement obviously is important, and then curing. Once you've placed your patch repair, patch repair material, curing is just so important in terms of achieving the performance um, characteristics that are needed that are specified for that patch repair material. And oftentimes, curing is sort of the last thing, and it's forgotten or not paid enough attention to. And um, you know, you won't achieve the specification and the design of the repair is done assuming a certain level of performance is going to be achieved from the patch repair product. When I say performance, I mean things like strength. I mean things like bond between the, the patch material and the, and the um, substrate, all these sorts of things. So it's important to follow the specification, but it's also important to follow all the manufacturer's recommendations of any product that you're using. So what are some of the keys to make sure that you, you, you get a good patch repair? So firstly, it's important to make sure that the specification for the patch repair is adequate and detailed enough. Probably in most cases, it's probably not really going to be enough just to tell them to follow the manufacturer's recommendations. It probably is worthwhile in most instances to have an experienced consultant develop a specification for the repair that's required. And then equally importantly, to make sure things, things are done as per the specification, it's important to have an experienced consultant supervise and sign off on the repairs. Otherwise, you just can't be sure that that they're actually being completed to the to the performance that has been expected and designed for. So you can you can sign off, you can certify those repairs by doing things like QA testing and verification that the repairs have have met the performance that is needed. That could be things like pull off tests or. Um, you know, even even things like non-destructive testing, UPV, um, to 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 make sure that the 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 patch repair is is no longer the, the area that's been repaired is no longer low low density or porous. It's it's no longer got voids, etc. These sorts of things, and you can do that for crack injection repairs too. Um. So yeah, so that's that's that. So next slide is on patch repair, 
and and anodes in in the patches. So, look, there are a number of growing anodes, number of anodes in the market, and that number of anodes is growing at a at a pace. Um, different anodes, and they they all have different performance levels. A lot of the anodes that are available in the market aren't actually cathodic protection anodes. They they will provide what is called cathodic prevention. So, what is the difference? Well. Let's take this graph on the left here. And this is a graph of chloride content on the right-hand side, on, on, the, on the horizontal axis. You've got, you've got your chloride content in the concrete by weight of cement. So as that goes up, your risk of corrosion of reinforcement increases. Now, this graph on the left, you have your potential of your steel. And so if you, if you have a normal situation, Without an anode, you have the you have your potential of your steel up here a little bit under zero millivolts, and as as the chloride ingresses into the concrete over time, you get into this pitting zone, where you will you will start to have corrosion occurring, and if you if you once you've reached that once you've reached that phase, you then need to achieve a big enough potential shift of the reinforcement if you're going to do try to protect the reinforcement using anodes, you need to achieve a big enough shift to go all the way down to F here, the zone of perfect passivity, which means, you know, you've got to, you've got to achieve, you've got to get the reinforcement potential down around minus 700 millivolts. Otherwise, if pre-existing pits are already there, they will still propagate if you don't achieve that full potential shift. And a lot of these cathodic prevention anodes that are available in the market just don't have the power to achieve that amount of potential shift. They would only achieve a smaller amount of potential shift and get you into the zone of imperfect passivity. Now, that zone of imperfect passivity is okay if you don't have corrosion already happening. So in scenario B, where if you installed those lower powered anodes up front, or, for example, in a patch repair, and it's to protect the surrounding concrete where corrosion hasn't yet started to occur, then you've got scenario B. And what that means is you've shifted, you've shifted the potential of the steel reinforcement enough such that the, the zone where you won't get new pits occurring means that you can have higher level of chloride ingress before corrosion will start to occur. So just a little bit of a shift means that you can go from, say, 0.4% weight of cement for, for reinforcement initiation all the way down to around about 1% before um, reinforcement might initiate. So that's where they can be useful, those, those cathodic prevention anodes. And there are also some, some, some patch repair anodes these days that um, can actually, that are actually powerful enough to provide proper cathodic protection and achieve that, 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 le that higher level of potential shift in the steel. So moving away from patch repairs now and um, on to cathodic protection systems for concrete structures, there's essentially three different types of CP system. There's a hybrid CP system, which is a sort of a, a newer approach. There's, and there's a tr two traditional sort of types of system with sacrificial anode cathodic protection, which is also called galvanic cathodic protection and impressed current cathodic protection. So hybrid cathodic protection is, is, is where you have an initial impressed current phase, which may be from a portable power supply or from battery power. And once you've once you've charged up the structure with a with a relatively high level of current and you've achieved a, a good potential shift in the reinforcement, you then switch over to a longer term galvanic cathodic protection system. So this is quite an innovative and novel approach. It's been around for for you know probably you know a decade or, or longer now, but it's relatively new compared to the other techniques. However, there is still some controversy around the theoretical basis of the system in some in some papers etc um, in terms of concrete sacrificial anode systems excuse me while I just get a quick sip of water as I said before there are some higher powered anodes available in the market now which can provide true cathodic protection I'm talking about sacrificial anodes some of those and then there's also um, other systems sacrificial systems like roll anodes which can be drilled and dis so dis discrete anodes, which can be drilled into the structure, and and then you know the the anode material will consume preferentially to the steel rather rather than the steel corroding. There's also surface systems, surface mounted systems, which can be employed, such as a zinc layer anode system, and um, one of those 
a zinc layer anode type system has been used has been being used quite successfully on a number of magnesites floor magnesite affected floor slabs in particular around Sydney now, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. Impressed current anode systems um, include things like titanium mesh, titanium discrete systems, which again are drilled into the structure. So a mesh system is one which is probably good for when you're covering a, a large area like a, a wall or a slab and a titanium ribbon structure, which can be embedded into slots. There's also things like um, surface mounted mixed metal oxide titanium anodes, um, which can be mounted to the surface and it, they, they come in in things like cassettes or in discs. And there's also um, some paint on CP systems, impressed current systems, such as the Zebra system, but these haven't really taken a huge amount of traction in Australia at this point in time. However, they, they are quite popular and common in other areas of the world, such as Europe, etc. And they're often used on things like car park decks. So what we do at PCRC as part of our EPIC repair process in terms of is in terms of cathodic protection is we 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 look at we look at things holistically. We look at all the different systems that are available in the market and we we assess what the client needs are in terms of maybe they have a certain budget. So there's a cost, obviously there's always a cost side of things to consider. There's also what is the client's appetite for things like install speed? Do they want less disruption? Um, do they need flexibility of the system? Do they is aesthetics an important consideration? So you know some of the systems won't be won't be score very highly when it comes to aesthetics, particularly those surface mounted systems like the cassette or the or the disc systems I was talking about in terms of impressed current systems. So all those things are considered by us, and we give these things a weighting score. And this is an example of uh, one basement in in the city in Sydney that we looked at one once a few years ago. And we looked at all, the, so these are all the different types of, uh, very, not all, but a number of different types of impressed current systems available in the market. So this is like a net anode, um, sawtooth ribbon anode system, a ribbon mesh anode system embedded in slots, and then some surf, surface mounted systems and, and a discrete anode system as well, so which is drilled in to and uh, at, at certain spacings. And we looked at the initial cost, so the upfront capital cost of installation. We considered what the cost would be in terms of a maintenance and monitoring scenario as well over time, you know, over the design life. And so that, that gives a total, total score in terms of cost considerations. And then we also looked at the other things I was just mentioning, like reliability of the system, et cetera, et cetera, and various different scores for various different systems. So. That was, that's, we find this is a really good way for us to be able to systematically understand, okay, in this scenario with this client and what, they, what their needs and wants are, these are the scores for the different systems. So we can then rank the top two or three systems that, that appear to come out. And we can do that for impressed current systems, or we can do that for sacrificial systems or hybrid systems. And we can then recommend to the client that these are the sort of the top two or three systems that we would recommend for this particular application based on the um, the, the comparison and that we've done. Another example is this old building in Sydney uh, where they had some, some old concrete lintels, reinforced concrete lintels, which were deteriorating and needed to be protected to extend their service life. Initially, there was a call for bids before BCRC were involved, which was based on, you know, there hadn't been any, test, any testing at all done on the, on the lintels. And it was a call for bids based on a hybrid system. And some of the tenderers that um, looked at that tender identified some alternative systems and and flagged that there potentially they felt that there was a bit of an issue with the limited number of hybrid and CP designers that were around at the time. And so the client then came to us and um, and requested the the application of our BCRC selection approach, which I've just been through. So what we did was we investigated, we identified, firstly we said, well look, really we need you need to have some testing done on this structure before before we can, you know, properly consider things, um, because testing is not only important from a re understanding a remaining service life point of view, but it's also important to inform any CP design. You can't really do a proper CP design if you don't understand what, for example, what the concrete resistivity is, what the chloride level is, what the cover is, what the reinforcement spacing is, and density, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we we identified we did some testing and inspection using smart inspect process, and then we um, identified. Two, two, two systems which scored the most highly on the comparison system that we that we used 
for both SACP and for ICCP. And those systems are shown here in this diagram. For the SACP, it was either a roll anode system embedded into, into the middle of the, of the lintels, and they would therefore protect all the steel, or zinc layer anode, surface mounted zinc layer anode, oops, sorry, go back on either side. And we also found that the best, two best um, impressed current systems for this application were, the, were a discrete anode system or a corrodus surface mounted system. Um, and then we gave that to the client. So in terms of our magnesite repair approach that we've developed over recent years in BCRC, and we're finding clients are very, very happy with, what it is is again, you've also you've obviously also always got to do your your investigation, your smart inspect, and then you've got to understand your remaining service life via that creed modeling that I've mentioned earlier. And then what we're finding is that although we will still consider other CP systems, really pretty much all the time for magnesite floor repairs, we're finding that the ZAP magnus the ZAP magnesite zinc layer anode surface mounted system is um is um really very effective because what it does is it means that you don't you only have to break out the loose concrete as opposed to getting rid of all the contaminated chloride so when you compare it to a you know a more conventional patch repair approach or you know we've seen a lot of magnesite affected slabs in sydney apartment buildings that are so badly gone that basically the whole top half of the slab needs to be reconstructed if you're going to do a conventional repair and you know that's incredibly disruptive and incredibly expensive to to surrounding apartment owners and to owners corporations so we're finding that the ZAP magnesite system reduces the amount of disruption, reduces the amount of noisy concrete breakout because you don't have to, you only have to break out the loose and spalled concrete. You can leave the rest of the contaminated concrete in place, and uh, you know you, you obviously treat the corrosion where it's been where it's exposed, and then you you perform you you install the cathodic protection, and if needed, if some of the reinforcement is so far um, corroded that the section loss is such that cut, some strengthening of the slab might be needed then you can add in some carbon fiber strengthening potentially to, to the ZAP magnesite system to fix that issue as well. And here's just one photo, one example of that ZAP magnesite system in a, in being installed in a, in a, in a magnesite affected building. And you can see actually, if you've, got a, if you've got a sharp eye, you might notice that the magnesite's actually still in place in this case. Now we don't usually recommend that that's a good approach because if you leave it in place, you know, you're leaving you're leaving a latent risk in place essentially. However, you know it can be left in place if that is what is the desired out the desire of the of the owner. Another example of um, sacrificial anode cathodic protection system. And by the way, I'm talking about when I'm talking about these examples, I'm giving examples that do provide true cathodic protection, not just cathodic prevention. Another example here is a zinc layer anode system, surface mounted system that has been installed on the side of some concrete swimming pools, large concrete swimming pool um, precinct. Uh, it, what I would say, what I want to point out about this one here is that you might have noticed that in the previous slide, there was some spacing between the zinc layer anode strips. And that was because that was how it was designed. That, enough, that, that amount of zinc anode was needed to provide that cathodic protection for the amount of steel reinforcement in that slab. In this case, the side of the pool walls had so much reinforcement in them that we actually, our design demonstrated that we actually needed to have 100% coverage of zinc layer anode. And also the zinc layer anode needed to be twice as thick in order to achieve the cathodic protection for the given design life extension. It's just another photo showing uh, a bit more of that. And then, <clears throat> Here's another example of an old, it's actually basically an old toilet block, you might call it that, an amenities building at, um, at, a, at a beach on the south coast of New South Wales. And, you know, the local community, they really enjoyed the look of this toilet block, <laughs> this amenities building, and they didn't want it to be necessarily to be, to be knocked down and rebuilt, although the condition in, in it was such that that probably would have been the most sensible option. So there was political reasons why the asset owner wanted it to be kept in place and the life of it extended. So we did a big smart inspect investigation to understand the condition and the remaining service life. And then we, uh, in this case, we specified a mixture of protective coatings, patch repairs, some crack injections needed to be completed and, uh, and some super anodes, GSC super anodes, which are high powered embedded anodes in the concrete to reduce the amount of concrete repair, concrete patch 
um, breakout that was needed and also concrete repair that was required based on based on if, if just those, you know, lower powered cathodic prevention anodes had been used. And we were able to achieve a 20 year service life extension for that one. And I'm pretty sure that it was one, it was an ACRA member contractor that might have uh, done the repair on that one for us. So that was good. So just some take homes from Epic Repair, the, our process for Epic Repair. So in, in a nutshell, in summary of what I've been saying there, hybrid CP and sacrificial anode CP systems they are available in the market these days, and they can be serious alternatives to impress current cathodic protection to provide proper cathodic protection for a given service life extension. Now, I'm not suggesting that there isn't a place for impress current systems. Impress current systems are oftentimes still the best idea. However, they do have some some things that need to be considered. They can be quite it can be more costly because of the monitoring. Not necessarily more costly in the in the installation phase, but once in the terms of whole of life costs, once you factor in the monitoring that is required with impressed current systems um, over the life to make sure they're still working, then those costs can add up. So with sacrificial anode systems, you, you, they can be a set and forget sort of system where you you basically put it in place and it doesn't need to be monitored. However, if it's a large um, cathodic protection job that is being done, it is probably still prudent to, to, to have a level of monitoring. So with ICCP systems, um, there, are, there are some system componentry that can decrease the reliability of the systems and can fail early. And that's why that monitoring is important to make sure that the system is still operating and providing protection. So things like the power supply, the, the power supply control unit themselves, the reference electrodes can fail early or they have a limited design life. All the wiring and componentry that is needed to provide that direct electricity, that direct power supply for an impressed current system. Um, all these things are, are, are things that can fail prematurely and can decrease the reliability of impressed current systems. And also it is quite heavily reliant on the, on the asset owner um, to be aware of all these risks and to make sure they 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 do com, um, do com, do continue to do that monitoring and I think there's been many examples that I've seen of over the years where the asset owner whether it's the person that was tasked with it leaves the company or or, or whatever it might be after a period of time they don't they sort of drop up, drop off and they don't do the monitoring that is needed and so the impressed current system is sitting there and something fails and it's not actually providing the protection even though it's it's supposed to still have say 30 years of design life left for example another some other take homes are that there's a huge array of repair solutions and products available on the market in terms of patch repair products protective coatings etc and so how do you, how is someone supposed to choose what is the appropriate product and the appropriate repair system for a given deteriorated structure that's really where it is really beneficial to seek the advice of an experienced repair consultancy, not necessarily just a structural engineer, although some structural engineers have enough experience with repairs, concrete repairs to, to provide good advice, but someone that is actually a specialist with, in terms of durability and materials and repair, repair that, that can provide um, good advice to ensure that valuable repairs are achieved. So I hope you've enjoyed listening to me and Kurosh today talk, talk you through that. So just to recap, we've talked to you about our smart inspect process, our creed, reliability, engineering, and full probabilistic analysis for durability modeling, and, uh, and EPIC repair, our, our repair design consultancy service line. And um, I hope that uh, that was of value for you all. Excellent. And I've just got, I've oh. just got one oh. final, sorry, Graham. No, just right. to finish off in a light-hearted way, I thought I'd just I thought this was uh was was worthwhile playing just one minute video, so it's not too long. What's this one? The wonderful world of concrete. I've been looking for that. Is it your book, Daddy? It's a book I borrowed from the library. What's a library? It's a place you borrow books from, and when you've finished reading them. You take them back. But Daddy Pig has forgotten to take this book back. I have had it for rather a long time. Never mind. You can take it back tomorrow. <laughs> but now it's bedtime. After Daddy reads this story. It's not much of a story, Pepper. Please read it, Daddy. OK. <laughs> the Wonderful World of Concrete. 
Concrete is a construction material composed of sand, water, and chemical admixtures. Chapter 1. Sand. Pepper, George, and Mummy Pig have fallen asleep. All right, there you go. Over to you, Graham. How rude. That's what I say. What kind of a family is he raging? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. Haven't seen that episode of Pe Peppa Pig. Um, now I have, I don't have to see it again. Yeah. Um, all right, so thanks guys for putting that together. We do have a little bit of, oh, sorry we are running a little bit over time, but uh, William's got to do his um, little presentation as part of his sponsor's duties and or opportunities. And then we've got a few questions that are in the Q&A. So, um, or throw to the panel to answer those in due course. But William, can you um, jump on? How do we get you on screen? Hi. Thanks, Graham. How's it oh, going? Good. <laughs> no, I've vanished for a while. Let's the focus sit with Kuosh and Jonathan. And thank you so much for that presentation, Kuosh and Jonathan. Um, it's really nice to sponsor um, an event with Aqua and also to talk a little bit about the importance of a sophisticated data handling process. Of course, Jonathan mentioned a couple of tools we do supply. We had the um, inspect software by Screening Eagle, which I'm very happy to talk to anyone at great, possibly exhaustive length down back to the paper, big story about data handling and the use of that tool. But what I sort of want to highlight in general is whenever you're taking inspection data, you probably already have tools available to you to get started with this kind of structured data handling. Um, this is just a coating thickness gauge typically used for coatings over concrete. And I've just quickly whipped together um, a three sort of three minute presentation into a minute of just how you can document what you've done, get all of your data and the, and the distribution of these measurements in a second using the functionality that, well, people take these gauges on and they'll write the numbers down or they'll take a picture of the screen, completely missing that they've already got a tool that lets them work um, at quite a high level in terms of gathering meaningful information. Um, so I've just quickly whipped out a PDF report, um, only for coding thickness, but that's an important value for our applicators. Um, and then when, once you've got information like that, you can start working in tools like Inspect, where we can, Go straight into this sort of sort of document here, and place that information straight into the straight into our spots. Um, so the intent of a data handling tool has a couple of purposes. One is to replace the notepad. So you're not taking paper notes, you're not writing down numbers, you're not re-entering things back at the office. The second purpose is structured data. So this is just a generic. Um, form I'm filling in, but you can structure these forms as Kua showed to meet your precise requirements. If you're do, again doing a bill of materials type measurement, you can get the numbers and the areas you need into these these data formats so that you can keep them there. Uh, if you're doing a large scale NDT inspection, you can store your inspection data or the reports from the data logging of your tools straight in, and it does two things. One, you've got those numbers there, you can export and do statistical analysis, do the reports. The second thing is, you've got a database. We have here many, many, many points of information, each with distinct data, little hand sketches, all sorts of stuff accessible um, just by browsing around on an iPad or a computer screen um, as the record of that inspection. So if you come back in two years time and you've got no idea what you did on your cooling tower the last time the shutdown happened, well, now you've got the inspector's notes, you've got the formal records, you've got the original data all in one place, all to work with. So that's just what I, um, uh, the final thing I'd like to highlight is a couple of points Jonathan made. And that is, yes, the limitations do matter for this tool. I showed you a video of a coding thickness gauge. It's an ultrasonic gauge. There's strengths and limitations. It's seen an awful lot of use for waterproofing thickness measurement recently, but if an operator goes out with that tool and he just says, oh, it's a tool to measure the thickness of the waterproofing, he'll get the wrong number. He needs to have that background of understanding the physics behind it, understanding the correct procedure to use it, and understanding its limitations so he can judge for an individual set of measurements 
is this a meaningful representation of my thickness of my material or is the machine not performing today? And it's the same with radar, the same with any other tool. A skilled operator can understand how it works, and but he can also understand how to tell, is it a good spot for it or a bad spot for it, and the quality of the data they're collecting. So um, I believe we're going to have a few questions at this moment. Um, and I see we've already got a few there, so I look forward to putting a response to a few of those. But thank you so much for the chance to sponsor. If you are interested in learning more about handling the data on projects or thinking about structured data and inspection, please do get in touch with PCTE. I'm the New South Wales manager. We've got a team here and other offices around Australia and New Zealand. So very happy to discuss any of the NDT tools you might be considering or how to bring uh, Screening Eagle Inspect into your business. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, William. Um, yeah, so gents, uh, I guess the panel, Jonathan Kirsch and William, there are a, a few questions here. I think you, uh, a couple have been answered live, but Paul Vince has asked, for patch repairs, what steps do you recommend to isolate the new reinforcement from the previously embedded reinforcement? Jonathan or Kurosh, maybe? Paul, hi, Paul. Thanks for your question. Um, to be honest, Paul, I, I, I'm probably not the best person to answer this one. I, I, I certainly think that one of the directors of BCRC would be in a position to answer it effectively. But um, rather than try and give you a, a wishy-washy answer, I, I, I feel like uh, I'm best to just leave that over. I can come back to you once I've once I've talked to the directors or perhaps even Graham, you might have a um, an idea on that one. Mm. Um, um, one point on a question that was answered, Graham. Um, the question on would concrete maturity testing work for patch repair strength mon monitoring? Jonathan did answer that. You'd have to understand the properties of the material to use maturity-based strength testing for understanding it. And that's quite correct. The other thing I wanted to quickly point out about maturity testing of concrete strength uh -huh. is it's a time-based measure and it doesn't give you a characteristic 28-day strength. So if whenever you're using a maturity logger or something to monitor temperature and calculate in situ strength of concrete on a project or other materials where that's appropriate you're getting a snapshot in time it is 30 mpa strength today you're not able to calculate that out to the 28 day point and it's not appropriate to use that consideration which is purely about calculation of curing and the effect of the heat around it to understand the characteristics of that material. So you could use it to know, is my patch repair material up to strength for trafficking? But you couldn't use it to be a final test of quality of that patch material. That would still require a conventional laboratory test or another test that takes the physical element, the material itself into account, not the heat it was sitting at and the curing properties of that material. It's a distinction, but an important one of in situ strength, sort of uh, early age strength today and strength as it comes back to quality. Yeah, good point, William. Oops. Okay. Um, yeah, back to the patch repair question. Uh, I guess it really depends. Are you trying to maintain structural continuity of the reinforcement? In which case, you're going to have to deal with the metallic differential probably through a sacrificial anode or some electrochemical means so that you, you're reinstating the structural, but also managing the durability conflict. Um, as a general approach, that's how, how we'd be doing it. Uh, hopefully that's enough, but there could be specific circumstances where you might need to isolate them completely, um, use different materials, but then you've got to deal with the engineering requirement of that element. It's not just a cover material to stop it corroding. Um, okay, there's a couple here from Deepak. Uh, yeah, the videos and slides will be made available after. That's, I think, something we've offered to do. Yep. And lift, list of references, Jonathan. Will that be in the slides? Um, I, we can probably dig out some references if if, uh, yeah, where, where, that, where that's appropriate, we could do that.
I think you're on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the last question there from Deepak was about whether ACTA would produce a guide with respect to this information today. Um, uh, probably not. We don't typically do that with the webinars. Uh, it is just as as presented from the specialists in the industry that information is shared. Um, last question here is about corrosion rate measurement techniques. Uh, could they be utilised as an additional test to understand a structure's health and help with service life protection? Oh, absolutely. That's, most definitely, they can be. Yeah, we didn't um, we didn't touch on every every NDT technique that we that we um, have experience and capability with, or that is that is available to to assess it, the remaining service life of a concrete structure. But totally, yes, like half cell potential testing or linear polarization resistance testing to get corrosion rate as well as corrosion risk. All those things uh, uh, can definitely add value. Um, we find in BCRC sometimes, depending on the the budget and the size of the inspection and that is being that is being um, completed, that it can be a bit not, maybe not cost effective to in some cases to do that half cell potential survey. But oftentimes it is valuable, and because what it does is it allows you to understand where the reinforcement is already actively corroding, or where there's a high chance of that happening, and where there's a a high chance of it still being passive. And then in the passive areas, you know that, because in the in the actively corroding areas, you know that the remaining service life is already quite limited. It's already corroding. In the passive areas, um, that's where you can focus your things like your core tests for chloride and carbonation ingress, et cetera, et cetera, to then determine the remaining service life in those areas where the steel is still passive. So yes, answer to the question is yes, absolutely. Good, good. Thank you. All right, well, that's, that's all the questions we've got. Um, would like to thank again, sponsor William at PCTE and Josh and Jonathan for putting this together. Much appreciated. Uh, the next few events that are coming up. Oh, yes. Yeah, so Nicole will send out the, the a link to the presentation for all the registrants to have a look at later. Um, and that'll, I think, also have details uh, on the BCRC team for contact and discussion, as well as PCTE, but I'm sure you can find them on the webinar as well. Um, now, upcoming events for New South Wales. Um, we've got another New South Wales portal planning uh, spot on the 31st of August. That's about the class two buildings, which it seems like some of this remedial work that we're talking about, magma site repairs, pr quite probably get sucked into that as well, unfortunately. Um, in WA, we've got a seminar for cracks in concrete structures and repairs on the 20th of September. Um, and also, <clears throat> pardon me, on the 21st, the concrete repair and protection course, the one day course is being run over in Perth as well. Um, Victoria, we've got celebrating women in construction breakfast on the 29th of September. The next event after that is New South Wales introduction to the sphere of influence via B2B, business to business, social selling. That's a breakfast um, about that LinkedIn thing that we're all on. Queensland have the Acro Trade Show on the 19th of October. Trade tables are still available up there for anybody who's interested to take one up. And in Victoria, the last one on the current schedule is the Concrete Repair and Protection Course one day again, and that's on the 27th of October. And that's about it, people. Um, thank you for your time today. It's uh, another good episode of sharing information in the industry. And yeah, we appreciate your attendance. There is one chat message I've got in there, which is, oh, yeah. Nicole's going to send those links out this afternoon. So thank you and have a, have a safe working day. Bye.